Hello, I'm Jill Westerman. I'm Vice Chair of the Further Education Trust for Leadership and I'm here to talk to Professor Martin Dole, who's the Fettel Professor of FE and Skills, about his experience of being in that role um, for the last two and a half years. So, good morning, Martin. Good morning. So, you're the first Fettel Professor of FE and Skills. So, how has it been? What was your starting point and where's the journey taking you until now? Well, at first, I've got to say it's an absolute privilege to, after a, a kind of fairly lengthy career or two careers, to have this opportunity to both reflect and contribute from the basis of an academic position. So, very grateful indeed for having had that opportunity afforded to me by the Trust. Uh, how's it been? Um, well, the first thing, I think, mean, when you set into anything new, you have to think through what you can contribute most helpfully and usefully to the mission of the organisation that you're going to be a part of. And the key organisation I'm, I'm a part of is, is FETL, the Trust. So thinking through its mission of leading thinking mm -hmm. in further education and skills and seeing what the position at UCL Institute of Education allows me to do, most particularly in contributing to that mission. Um, and in that regard, I mean, it's thinking of put it in two dimensions, I think. First, how I can both affect thinking in the university about further education. It is a world-leading university. There are a number of influential voices and very uh, capable, inquiring minds there. But a, a limited understanding about what further education is uh, what further education and skills can contribute. So affecting thinking inside the university is important, but also then thinking about how I can benefit and the trust by implication can benefit from the thinking that's going on inside the university as well. So it's a two-way street and from the outset trying to think how and why and in which, what way we can best benefit from having the chair inside the university. So that's where I started from and I've now been thinking that through and trying to resolve down what I can do. Why do you think FE has been so underrepresented in terms of thinking with institutes of education? I think it's I, it's a combination of its, its history. It, it's, it, people represent it as an amorphous, amorphous character. The term for education is, is a very broad one, it's a very inclusive one, and as I kind of demonstrated in my first inaugural professorial lecture, which was a big deal, I didn't really know how, how, what a big deal it was in the university when I actually had to front up and in front of my contemporaries, peers and, and others explain, but in that lecture I, I explored the fact that this term for education has grown from the point of view of when it was first used in the early 20th century and has accreted other functions to it. So it started from a, a relatively narrow or narrow base of technical education or adult education. Various components were then lumped together to this term for education. And as they were lumped together, the distinctiveness in people's minds was, was muddied. Uh, that, that I, that sounds like a, a, a pejorative term. I don't think it's. I don't mean it to be pejorative. It's that inclusiveness, that openness, and what Dame Roof, uh, the, the chair of, of or the president of Fettel, as I identified, is it's it's a, been an adaptive layer. It's just grown functions, but in the minds of policymakers and researchers, it's kind of everything and nothing. In fact, what I came to the conclusion of is it, it, the definition of further education is actually being remarkably consistent. It's been defined by what it's not. Not education in a school or in a university. It's almost everything else that doesn't fit is poured into this domain called further education, which then policymakers play with bits of it rather than seeing it as a, 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 a holistic whole or a, a comprehensive system. So I think we've suffered both from the point of view of policymakers and for researchers looking at the totality, they tend to look at bits and not have a sense of the whole. So do you think it's as simple as that, that 
because it's not easy to define, HE researchers within education have largely, largely ignored it? Or do you think it's a, it's a broader symptom in terms of the place of further education within the thinking of policy makers, educationalists in general? I, there are other factors that affect it. So I think you're right to point out other factors, but I think the definitional aspect is a really strong one. I mean, it's affected by the fact that many researchers within university have gone, if you like, someone's called the academic high road. They went to a school, they then emerged in a university, became an academic, and the, the point at which they touch or feel further education has been very limited. Mm -hmm. um, there are those that have come through further, further education, worked in further education, and moved into the academic sphere, but they've been relatively s a small number. Mm -hmm. Much smaller number, I think, than those that train to be a teacher, become a teacher, then move into universities mm -hmm. to, to be uh, departments of education, to, to form the new, new teachers and teacher education, teacher research around practice. We have just been, by scale, much more underrepresented mm -hmm. in that space. And so far as it kind of academics, and sometimes academics beyond education, social scientists might look at us, or further education, or economists, they tend to look at the bit that affects their world. Mm. So you get people looking at technical education, you get people looking at careers education, you might get people looking at uh, social equity, hugely important, and, and looking at FE from that perspective, but they tend to look at the perspective they're interested in, rather than the totality of what further education and skills represent. And just thinking about that, I think that notion that we reflect on what's familiar to us initially, a, a, a lot of people talk about the way that the Secretaries of State really focus on the area of education that's been most important to them. Yeah. So I think if you think of the Secretaries of State, it was only David Blunkett who come through the FE system himself and taught in further education who actually focused on lifelong learning. I, I think that's right, but even in the case of... Uh, uh, David Blunkett, who you know, I'm a great admirer of and had a, an amount of work to do with him with the Association of Colleges. David's experience is partial. And I mean, he's a, a huge expo uh, exponent and, 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 you know, champion for lifelong learning. But we'll see it in a particular light, which is, in, in his sense, I think he went back to a, a college to get his A-levels, then to do his degree. Um, so he would see it in that sort of recovery yes. role. Yes. He won't see it in his the first choice, mm. potentially, for a young person who wants to follow a more practically based, uh, focusing on a job and or technical education route. So people see it from the partial backgrounds, even if they do have a knowledge mm. of, of, of the system. And because FE is so multifaceted, they can come thinking they have an understanding of further education when they don't, because they've only seen a part of that. So the starting point, I think y you referred to Dame Ruth talking about the aspiration of FETL was, was twofold. It was to take <coughs> HE into FE, but also to raise awareness of FE within HE. So y in a sense, you talked about the starting point being moving into a world where FE wasn't really thought about a lot and thinking is what Fettel wants to encourage. So how has it been? What's your experience of that of that progress or journey? Well I've been I mean it sounds like an advert here, but I've been very fortunate indeed to be in the Institute of Education located in UCL on, on at least two grounds. First of all, the home that, that was found for the chair was when the Centre for Post fourteen education and work within the Institute which has a long history of being involved in this area. It's one of the isolated islands of thinking in this regard. Uh, in ev but even in there, academics, as I, I be knew but have, have been reminded, tend to have quite particular interests mm. that they explore and go forward. Um, but finding myself in, in that situation, I think, was were very helpful insofar as I had it, colleagues who did know a lot about further education, but and took a longer view, 
but some of their thinking was a little bit behind where the world was. So I, I hope in some ways I've, I've, I've affected their thinking about the situation as it is now. And I also think the thinking wasn't just about further education, about the, how further education is seen by policymakers, mm. building on my previous experience at the Association of Colleges. So trying to combine those two worlds. So I hope I had an effect on the Institute, and that was a good place to be for me. But it's also been a time of real change with the Institute of Education because it's been merged and with the University College London, I mean, one of the top 20 universities in the world, with, with Nobel Prize winners all over the place. And it's been great to actually be able to reach out to the other departments within the university, beyond, beyond the narrow in the Institute. So there's the people who work in skills in the Institute. The Institute is much more than that. Still has a heavier influence on school education and higher education. But I've been able to affect the school and higher education people from inside the institution, it, inside the Institute, particularly around things like higher skills and higher level apprenticeships. But also been able to work out to places like uh, the Institute for uh, Innovation and Public Purpose, recently set up by a, a kind of world leading expert, uh, Mariana Mazzucato. And I'm hoping to be able to do work there, which takes FE out of the world we have and begins to affect and be affected by worlds beyond here. So, for instance, we've got a, a round table coming up shortly where Mariana's deputy, Pr Professor Reiner Cattle, is going to have a give us a view and, and kind of involve, be involved in a conversation about prospects for collaboration in further education between further education providers and between further education providers and other providers of education, uh, where previously it's been a very competitive field, particularly since 1992, and that's the predominant behaviour set, is how we move to both collaborative approaches as well as retaining a, mem a, a measure of uh, com competitive behaviour as well, and how those two things can coexist. They coexist in other sectors of the economy, so understanding how they exist in other sectors of the economy, what the conditions are and how that will happen is important. So that kind of link with another department is important. There's a further department, I'm, in a, I'm not so closely involved in this, but working for something like the Bartlett School of Geog Social Geography is seeing FE in its place, not, not in the locality, and how it affects others and is affected by them in, in, in social ecosystem thinking, which is a real growth area of thinking, both in the Institute of Education and I think also from University College London's point of view. I think you're beginning to tell me about the, I think, the preoccupations that, that you've had or that have grown during your time as the professor. Tell me a bit more about those and, and really I suppose are they different? Did you go in thinking this is what I want to be focusing on, this is my preoccupation, has that changed or has it been the same strands that have developed and grown? I have to say, well, great question. Insofar as I've never gone to a job, I think, or hope, with a predetermined idea of what I was going to do, because I think it's arrog or arrogant so to do that. You, know, you have a set of histories and views of your own and experiences that you take to any new role. Um, but I didn't go here with huge preoccupations. <sighs> Actually, when you say what have pre preoccupations have grown, it's has to be more about a uh, uh, focusing down. It was almost like being offered the sweet shop. There it was, world leading university, me sitting in my office, books behind me, colleagues to talk to, the opportunity to go and talk to FE colleagues, yeah. reflect on this. I wanted at one stage to, to, to solve the pro productivity puzzle. Well, I can't get real. Mm. What can I do mm. that's most effective and makes the best contribution? So the preoccupation didn't grow, they, they focused. And a, lot, a significant part of the first time in the chair was finding those things where you could focus down, where you could both benefit thinking with the Institute, benefit the work of the, the, the Trust, but also find something that was going to engage and stretch me mm. to and think the about. Sector, of course. And the sector, and, and the contribution to the sector, hopefully to, to stimulate debate and reflection with the sector. And the ones I've, I've, I've increasingly fallen back to to make real progress on, I think, was the one we were first talking about, is defining further education, understanding what, what its distinctive role is, and how that then 
affects policy makers thinking but also then thinking through how that might affect thinking at the individual institutional level and I, I wrestled for, for the initial stages about that unifying definition of further education. Have you got it? No, I've, I've, as I said before, I've come back to the conclusion it's defined by what it's not. Right. Not, so that, that doesn't take you very far. No. So sometimes when you, you, you're involved in, in kind of an inquiry, you find yourself in a cul-de-sac. So how do you get out the cul-de-sac? And so I could, I could def define the difficulty with affecting policymakers was its indistinct characterization. And therefore it became uh, you know, something that people become periodically interested in, but doesn't have a strong constituency, which is influential to speak up. So I can diagnose the problem. There is no single definition possible to achieve apart from what it's not. And I can see the consequences of that. What next do we do? So I did explore, have explored a couple of the offered definitions. I mean, the adaptive layer, I think, is a really helpful explanatory device. I think also Vince Cable's proposal of a dual mandate, one to provide technical and professional education that serves the needs of a locality and the economic needs, and at and the same time providing a second chance route for people that haven't succeeded the first time around. You can see how that's a persuasive, yes. and it captures a lot, yeah. but it doesn't give you a lot of direction in the yes, individual sadly, institution. any direction that might have come was by the election. And it was. It, it, it dissipated. Yes, it it's still a useful device, but I think it still does only takes you so far. And I think it un underestimates the potential tension between those two missions. Uh, so if you're providing technical and professional education, which responds to a local economic need, in advertising yourself to do that, you want to be seen as the first choice, mm. the best choice. At the same time, you're recovering those who've had a bad experience in education or bad, bad personal experiences in order to put... Them. Now, in marketing terms, that's an uncomfortable juxtaposition. I think it's one that colleges and others do remarkably well to reconcile, but it's always an uncomfortable... And I think the cable formulation explained what was, rather than get, gave a sense of direction. So uh, after having done that degree of kind of reflection. I, what I came down to, I think, is falling back to my previous experience, even before being at the Association of Colleges, having worked in the Armed Forces, but particularly the Joint Service and Staff College, teaching and reflecting on military strategy and business approaches, and came back to a consideration that in this circumstance, I think it's extraordinarily important that each institution gives consideration to its definition of its purpose. If we can't come up with one definition of the whole sector, which is kind of positive and moves forward in a way which is everyone can sign up to, I think it is for every institution and every provider to think through in strategic terms is what's the focus of their activities? What distinctively do they do? Not all that they do, but what I've come to begun to call their core purpose. And, and their subsidiary purposes. Is that something that you think some institutions haven't done? You know, as you've gone out into the world of further education and you've talked about the multiplicity of different sorts of provider, have they defined themselves? My working hypothesis is no, not. I mean, I've, I, I have done enough, I think, thus far in terms of personal knowledge and actually just desk research looking at things like the mission statement or purpose statement on college websites, for instance, or even just talking to college and working inside colleges. Um, subject them to subject those, if you look at those again, to a test. Um, a guy called uh, Rum, Rumout in the US, a uh, 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 leading thinker at UCLA, has evaluated strategies by saying that one of the ways you can judge a strategy is, is that a good strategy tells you as much about what you won't do as what you will do, and therefore provides you a focus and distinctiveness. If you look at most college mission statements, and or I have to say a number of fi private training providers and all others, they're so open-ended. Is that not because they're part of the adaptive layer? I think that's right, and I think this is the tension around the adaptive layer idea, that 
there's got to be a difference between being the adaptive layer and just going anywhere and doing anything uh, in order to survive or doing things you're not particularly good at that others would be, be best left to do. So that, that, that focus on what distinctively do I do. Now, this is where I come to the idea of core and contingent. Mm -hmm. Some t I'm not so unrealistic to say in times of you know, reducing funding and constraints and resources that people might not diversify their business away from the core in order to survive. And that's why I call it contingent or subsidiary purpose. But I think that organisations that most usefully, most have longer standing and are those that have a stronger sense of themselves and what their core purpose is, uh, that people can identify, understand, collaborate with, because it's easier to know. And sometimes they'll take on contingent purpose because nobody else can do it as well as they might do locally, or there's an opportunity to generate resources in order or funding to support the, the core purpose. But the, the exercise of going through saying, what distinctively do I do? What do I do best? Who do I do it for? Gives, I think, the institution an idea of kind of duration and durability, which I think sometimes, in the face of you know extraordinary funding pressures, extraordinarily frequent policy changes affecting further education, has sends organisations in a kind of wavy line, and change their, their character sometimes changes without conscious thought or reflection. Um, and I've got to say, uh, we've, we've talked about this before, and I, the college that you led is remarkable, I think, for the sense, everyone knew, knew what Northern College was. You may have done other things from time to time, but you knew what the core of what you, therefore, other colleges in the local area, other providers, universities, uh, social services, knew what Northern College did, and therefore, was able to work with it. And Northern College had a firm sense of what its mission was and what excellence looked like for Northern College. And that was a conscious effort. It was conscious, and I think you're right, because the funding pressures could have caused Northern College to divert into other areas, and we chose not to. I think, though, that Northern College is quite a small institution. What happens when you have Barnsley College, which is a tertiary college? So the core purpose could be to um, educate young people to A-level, or it could be technical and professional, or it could be adult returners. Um, and looking at some of the huge merged London colleges, um, wouldn't they have a similar issue? Whereas a small college like Northern College or a private training provider that had just one focus, for example, training young people to become hairdressers, it, it's, it's a different... Um, beast, isn't it, in terms of how you define things? I think it is a different beast, but I would say that integral and, and critical to success of mergers, even those very large, much larger entities now, is going through the exercise of saying, mm. why are we getting bigger? Who do we serve? What do we provide? How can we do that in the best way possible? How can we do that in a way in which complements and adds value to the place we're in, the communities we serve. Now that might change over time, but my argument I think might be, Jill, that it changes in colleges too frequently. And it most often, then having changed, what it, it changes, then, then it gets almost stay behinds. Beyond the point at which the, the college needs to do A-levels, because there's better provision locally, it continues to do it because there are, there's inertia to it, or there, there, there's structures in place to be maintained. When the need then becomes technical and professional education, or something distinctive... That so feeds really onto the... They're just trying to add that to the mix, rather than thinking the through, what is focusing about what we do. So, I mean, I'd, 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 I'd hesitate to say, for every general, for every education college and every position, I have a core purpose defined, but I, I think it starts with something saying like, to provide technical and professional education to meet the needs of a geographical entity. Now that entity might be larger, might be smaller, it might do other things, 
but the core is that. Or it's the, the, that's that. And tell me about how that relates to your um, preoccupation. You talked about competition or collaboration. Because obviously, if you're thinking about place geographically, um, and I think you can perhaps think about place in a different way, but if you think about geographical place, yeah. then the competition collaboration within an area has to be focused, isn't it, on what the purpose of each individual provider I is? I think that's right. The, the, I, I think collaboration as a proposition uh, benefits from two particular things. There may be more when I'm kind of still thinking this through. One, it benefits from reciprocity and a sense of fairness. That if you, if you feel what you do is reflected in the person you're dealing with and you are treated fairly, or people act in a fair manner, then there's more likely to grow trust between those parties and they're more likely, therefore, to, to work in a way that's complementary and to the greater good. So this idea of a trust reciprocity is important. But I also think the idea of differentiation is important. If you compete in, in a Darwinian way or Hobbesian way, they, they, you compete on everything at all times in all ways. It's very hard to see how collaboration can grow from that circumstance. What I'm still wrestling with in my own mind is whether or not you can have that kind of differentiation without top-down direction within a system. That differentiation can arise bottom up. Um, the, uh, there's a very interesting almost four nation experiment going on now between the four nations in the United Kingdom. In Scotland, there is a more differentiated system with some significant benefits. Level four, five, technical professional education is better sustained in Scotland and has been for many years because it's not typically delivered in universities and it's seen as a core area for colleges. Mm -hmm. Colleges in Scotland don't deliver A-levels or hires equivalent in, in all but a few circumstances. So they're seen as being within an ecosystem, a particular type of role. Equally in Wales, hitherto, and I, I'm reticent here to, be, to make too large a generalisation, apprenticeships are more often delivered by independent training providers than they are by colleges. So the, the competitive landscapes and you slightly. seem to be saying that what is preferable is specialisation. Because what you have in Wales and Scotland yeah. is much more distinct specialisation yeah. rather sure. than this adaptive, yeah. you know, yeah. providers doing a lot of different yeah, things. Yeah, and e even if you have generalisation in Northern Ireland, for instance, it's geographical generalisation directed into groups rather than, as we have in, in England, moved through an area-based review process where people have almost picked sides rather than being directed <coughs> to do this. So I think that's right, but I'm arguing for more specialisation. My reticences is my belief, and I've kind of begun to use the term post-market circumstances, is how... What do you mean by that? Well, I, I, what, by that I mean, if, if, you're, if you want to s oversimplify this, in the, si the post war settlement period, perhaps up to the, the, the 1980s, there were still the remnants of a centrally led, planned e economy. And then we went through the Big Bang and through the n ev evolution of a market-led economy with free market and market thinking. I, mean, I, I, I hate the term, but people tend to use it a lot. Neoliberal thinking was predominant. So a market-led. So we went from a plan-led to a market-led. And this is a false, you know, it was a continuum. It was never quite as mm. stark as that. But I, kind of, I do feel we're moving into what I would call a post-market situation, where we have the remnants of, or the remnants of the market, mm -hmm. but accepting the market can't fix everything. The market can't be the, the invisible guiding hand. Hence, quite the way competition can't fix everything. Can't be, so therefore, we talk about collaboration. Mm -hmm. and we're, but we're, do we need to go all the way back to a centrally led, planned and directed solution here? Or is on that continuum between plan-led systems and uh, market-led semi-anarchy, where, where do we rest this again? You could swing all the way between the, the pendulum or say, perhaps we're moving to something new, which is, I mean, I'm, I'm getting pretentious now, I'm pretending to be an academic. You, in the dialectic, you go from the 
thesis, to yeah. the antithesis, yeah. and to, and you move on. So, so y it's that sort of movement forward to a post-market situation. That, and I'm interested to reflect on the fact whether or not in the modern economy, which, which, which is extraordinarily fast-moving, um, and even at the local level, much more complex than it was in the early part of the 20th century and through the mid-20th century, whether or not centrally-led approaches can work in these circumstances. It, it seems to me there will always be just behind where the, the problem is. And that, if that comes down to a college perspective, trying to direct precisely what specialism there is from the top down, or particularly what role you will do, or what you will do, will always seem to me uh, cursed to be just wrong, rather than seeking to be just right. So I, I, I think what I'm, I'm searching towards is whether or not we can combine a significant level of autonomy and responsiveness, which I think is important in modern economic circumstances, with a way in which specialisms specialisations, collaboration, differentiation can arise rather than being in detail directed top-down. Uh, because I think if you direct it top-down, you're going to lose some of that responsiveness, flexibility, and if you like, the adaptive layer. Because not the adaptive layer. So I, that's, what I think that's... And I think in that regard, this is why I'm so interested in this thing about boards of colleges and leaders within colleges, think, and also from independent training providers and others, Thinking through what their distinctive purpose is, thinking in a disciplined way, you know, you know, in a, it, it's not altruistic. I don't think about enlightened self-interest about what, who we serve, where are we serving, and what is the best contribution we're able to make. That then, I think, gives you a sustainable business, and one is there for the long term, with a sense of direction, and a sense of self. Does that lead, I know one of the things you've um, been thinking about is about community and place. So tell me how that links in with your thoughts about um, definitions. I think... Well, and control, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, can't, I think one of the devices I've, I've used in that area to challenge my own thinking and I've, I've been writing about is the difference between an institution that's of a place and for a place. Go on. Um, I think e if, you, if you go to a, a I, 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 I hesitate to over represent this again in terms of like Manchester um, the Manchester has a number of great universities but mostly Manchester University is a, man is a university that happens to be in Manchester mm. now it has great benefits to the as city are, as are probably the majority of universities uh, yeah. exactly my point mm. and the they, they make a contribution, but it's a contribution to the nation, to the world of knowledge, the world. And it has benefit to Manchester, but it's not in any sense, or not, no, it's not in the same sense, for Manchester. It's not, not driven by the needs of Manchester, the people of Manchester, uh, the skills requirements of Manchester, that, that they acknowledge them, but it's not the central. Nor should it be, I have to say, in, in many universities, the, as I've become aware, sitting inside a, a wrestle group university, there's a proper, and a really honourable, proper and right view that universities must be s disinterested. Or academic autonomy is important, driven by the need to, to forge new knowledge and to respect academic independence and the ability to speak out in that way. If you start with an institution which is responding to local need, in a, in a way in which is much more direct, it's instrumental. And there, there, there are bits in that it's not an instrumental, it's about developing the, the, the young people, the, the students, and actually having academic integrity. But I think there's a substantial difference between an organisation which is avowedly applied and for, and one that happens to be in that place. So that distinction, I think, becomes important. It, it also becomes important in I'm taking a different direction about my thinking about technical education and some of the, 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 dis the disagreements I have with some academic colleagues about 
is there a boundary between technical professional education and higher education? I, my fear is many universities with that view of academic independence, many people that work in them, will see it as an anathema to be taking what industry needs and turning it into a curriculum and having their, their content within their programmes significantly determined mm. by what industry needs. That's, that really, for not all universities, for many universities, is a very difficult place to be in. So, And interestingly, I think probably that some of the more forward-thinking universities are doing exactly that. I was thinking of Chris Husbands, yeah. who of course Fettle liaised with to set yes. up your role. Yeah. And he wants his current university, Sheffield Hallam, to become the world's largest applied university. So I think uh, you could say that that's almost an element of competition that he sees his university is very much moving into that space. Yeah. It's interesting that, you know, nobody ever wants to go back to anything. They always want to go forward to that, and I think it's absolutely right. But you could almost say this is the reinvention of the polytechnic. Um, and that's kind of missing space currently between what many further education colleges do and what many universities is, is vacated space. Um, so two questions to finish Martin. The first is probably a difficult one. What difference do you think you've made to the world of higher and further education? And then what do you think the future holds for the further education sector and what do we do need to do now to prepare for that future? Oh, well, the, the first one is a difficult question because you know, I think it'd be arrogant to, to evaluate reliably what your own contribution, what difference you're making. It's for others to judge effectively. If, if I were to say what I hope I've done, I think I hope I've stimulated greater understanding of further education within the university in which I'm operating now, added to the perspective of colleagues, affected their thinking, and looking outside um, to the college sector or, or back into the college sector and with colleagues at Fettel, I hope I've stimulated a debate, a debate amongst that distinctiveness issue and about how you generate focus. And I do see more thought and consideration being given to what's a distinctive contribution we can make. And I, the, the, even just the growing use of the term technical and professional education is kind of indicative of people thinking more precisely and uh, consciously about the difference they make. Now, how long that lasts, we'll see. Um, but, but, but hopefully, stimulating that debate and greater reflection and thought is what I hope I've done. And the future? And the future. Well, some days you, you, you woke up pessimistic and some days you woke up optimistic. I think the only way to go forward in life is to wake up more days optimistic than pessimistic. Um, if I were taking a pessimistic view, which some days I do, perhaps on a Monday morning or, or after a hard night the night before, um, it does feel like a bit of a cycle. We've been here before. We've had MVQs. We've had diplomas. We've had T-levels. We've had appren modern apprenticeships. We've had trained again. We've got apprenticeships. We've got and it, things go around in a cycle, and we never escape that cycle. But actually, I, I, I don't think that's the case. I think that we're actually a very interesting point. And I think there are a number of external circumstances combined with capabilities that exist within further education that gives me significant cause for optimism. Um, if you look first, I think, in terms of the changing nature of society and the economy, then it's almost the answer is further education and what's provided with further education uh, institutions and providers. Uh, the immediate one that everyone's talking at the moment is about Brexit and the need to, to grow our own skills. I link that to you know, r a realisation that we need to be more productive and productivity comes from increased skills and it particularly comes from intermediate level skills and it becomes about having education that meets the needs of society as well as the individual, which is playing in the space where most further education providers are. So they become the answer to that, that, that need. It's also the whole issue around social fairness mm -hmm. seems to me to be gaining greater traction and the importance of place through devolution. Again, 
you see further education being much more in that space and needed to be the solution. And you see it about talking about community well-being. Mm. And uh, ageing population, and demographics. Aging population. Yeah. And interestingly, a, a recent visit uh, to China, the Chinese wanted to ask us about adult education and continuing education, recognising there's an ageing population and that people are going to have many careers, but also they need to be mentally stimulated yes. and feel well. Into the, again, this is, this is our space. Um, but there are certain conditions over what we meet to turn that optimism into reality, and clearly one of the key ones is, is funding. Um, we, we take in hits. Here, there, here in that space, I kind of guarded optimism insofar as the 2015 spending review seemed to me to, to be bottoming out the cuts that have been made disproportionately to further education. And I don't sense any first real wish to take more money away from further education. In fact, someone's gone back in through the apprenticeship prep uh, levy and also from T-levels, but it tends to have been partial and particular. Uh, the 2019 spending review, I think, will be really important if my, see my optimism's kind of sustained or my pessimism's reinforced. So that's an important time. But the other thing I think is, he, those are external things. Those are things that are happening outside us is what we can do to prepare for that. And I do think, without banging on too much about your own ideas, a key thing that institutions can do now, and providers can do, and charities can do, is think about what their core purpose is, what they do well, so they're ready to take advantage of the, you know, the, re the reverse of the, pop the, the demographic trough, to take advantage of the, the need to actually grow our own skills, take advantage of the the wish to try and equal out outcomes between places. So thinking through what you do, how you do it, who you do it for, and how you'll do it well, seems to me to be what colleagues do. And then they can fold their breath to these things come home. Then they'll inherit the earth at last. And finally, Martin, I think reading is obviously an important part of thinking. What would you recommend that we read? Um, but the, this is where the treasure trove opened to me, and I like, so trying to work this out to which ones I'd really recommend. I would recommend uh, cap capitalism without capital. I think underwrites a lot of the thinking in the industrial strategy. And if I were leading uh, Westlake and Haskell, I might have that the wrong way around. But I, I do think it informs a lot of the thinking that's on the industrial strategy now, and also interestingly has an effect also on the, the Labour Party's thinking. I would think I'd also, so I'd look at cap capitalism without capital. I'd look at Mariana Mazzucato's work around the entrepreneurial state and the enabling state, um, which is kind of really interesting. And finally, I would look at in str strategic terms. I might I'm generally got and, and you know, get very nervous around and we'll have an anathema for management books. But there's a book by Rumfeld called Good strategy, bad strategy, and why the difference matters, which I really would commend to people to read. It's an easy read, it's a good read, but it's got some really clear thinking within it. Martin, thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you for listening. If you want to see more conversations like this, they're available on the FETL website, along with a lot of other resources. And what we hope is that you'll be able to use those for discussions at board level, with senior teams, with staff generally, really to stimulate thinking in our sector. Thank you.